Psychiatric Times wrote this article, is video game addiction a disorder? In Ohio, a 17-year-old boy shot both of his parents, killed, killing his mother because, what, what a great story you put here, Tyler. Thank you for the soft story. <laughs> oh, these feel-good classics. Because they, took away his Halo, because they took away his Halo 3 video game. His defense was that he was pushed to the brink uh, by his addiction to video games, often playing for 18 hours straight. In South Korea, a couple was arrested for being so obsessed with video games that their infant daughter died of malnutrition. Okay, Now, this is these guys have issues here, 18 hours a day. In response to statistics like this, the World Health Organization in 2018 officially included Internet Gaming Disorder, ICD, in the International Classification of Diseases, noting that this is disorder resulted in marked distress or significant impairment in personal, family, social, educational, occupational functioning. WHO further noted that associated health uh, concerns, including insufficient physical activity, poor diet, problems in eyesight, uh, with eyesight and hearing, um, sleep deprivation, aggressive behavior, and depression, as well as poor psycho psychological functioning in 2020, consumers in the U.S. spent $57 billion on video games, beating 2019 by 27%. Projections that by 2023, next year, that $57 billion is going to be $217 billion. How much of this is on the kid? How much of this is on the society? How much of this is on their parents? I think there's a bigger debate about addiction we can come to in a second. But if you think about these video games, this is going to be too negative an analogy, but let me say it and then I'll explain why it's a bit too negative. If you think about them as a virus, right, uh, that come along that would be compelling in any situation, they've arrived at a moment when kids' immune systems are already down, right? So they're more likely to be infected by the virus and for it to take them over. So I'll give you two examples. Children now sleep 85 minutes less than they did a century ago. Now you all know, we all know, if we've had a night where we haven't slept, you're much more likely to just spend the next day mindlessly scroll through TikTok than you are to read a book, right? So partly our kids are severely sleep deprived and that is making them more vulnerable to this stuff. Also the diet our children eat, um, the food we feed our kids makes them much more vulnerable to this stuff as well. And I stress again, it's some of it, some of the video gaming is good. But you think about how we eat, there's three big ways in which the way we our kids eat and the way we eat, in fact, is damaging our ability to focus and making us more vulnerable to the kind of things you're describing. The first is, so imagine you have the standard American British breakfast, the kind of thing I grew up having, I'm sure you guys did, kind of sugary or in Germany, sugary cereal or white bread with butter or whatever, right? What that does is that releases a huge amount of energy really quickly into your brain, right? And it feels great. You're like, I've fucking woken up. You know, you've got a rush of glucose. But what happens is you'll get to your desk or your kid will get to their school desk an hour or two later and you get a huge energy crash. Because, you know, the way Dale Pinnock, one of the leading nutritionists in Britain, put it to me, is it's like you're putting rocket fuel into a mini with you know, those little British cars, mm -hmm. right? It'll go really fast for five minutes and then it'll just Boom. stop, right? Yeah. So the way we eat causes energy spikes and energy crashes, which leaves you with brain fog. When your energy crashes, you get brain fog. You just can't think clearly until you have another sugary carby snack, right? So one of the things that we're doing is we're, we're if you, by contrast, if you eat a food, if you eat food, that releases energy steadily throughout the day, which is what you know almost all our ancestors ate, you're able to pay attention more evenly and you're less likely to just get into these slumps where just anything that wants to fuck with your attention will seem appealing. Second way it, it, our diet is damaging our ability to focus is that um, your brain in order to develop properly needs certain nutrients. And the diet we currently eat is lacking a lot of those nutrients like omega-3s and supplements don't cut it because your body doesn't absorb supplements in the same way. Third way is to me the most shocking and I think to you as a dad most, most uh, relevant, although they all are, which is there was a, it's not just that our diets lack things we need, they contain chemicals that act on us like drugs. So there was a study in Britain in a city called Southampton in 2007. They got nearly 300 kids and they split them into two groups. The first group was just given water and the second group was given water laced with a load of the food dyes that occur in the kind of food you get in the supermarket, in M&Ms, that kind of thing. 
and then they monitored them. The kids that drank the food dyes were significantly more likely to become manic, to run around, which would have made them more mm-hmm. vulnerable to the kind mm-hmm. of things you're talking about. So you can see how, and these are just two of the many factors that I talk about in the book that are affecting our kids' attention. So you can see how that's like lowering your immune system so that when something that wants to fuck with your attention comes along, it's easier for it to infect the child. Which is not to say there aren't healthy uses of video games. There totally are. I'm not opposed to video games, just like I'm not opposed to technology or the internet more generally. But we've got to look at these things. But there's a bigger debate about addiction that I can talk about where I think this video game addiction stuff, um, how would I put it? I think it can be interpreted, this is not what you're doing, but I think it can be interpreted simplistically. And this is because I went on a long journey about learning about addiction for a previous book I wrote called Chasing the Screen, where so there's a lot of addiction in my family. One of my earliest cocaine. memories, cocaine was a, was a, um, uh, it, was, it was mostly prescription drugs. Yeah. Um, so one of my earliest memories is of trying to wake up one of my relatives and not being able to. And um, uh, funny enough, it's, it's similar places. Iran and Germany were two, the, two of the countries my family lived in as well. So similar to you. Um, and when I started doing research on addiction almost exactly 10 years ago, if you had asked me about, let's say heroin addiction, because that was also close to me. If you'd asked me what causes heroin addiction... I would have looked at you like you're an idiot. And I would have said, well, Patrick, the clue's in the name. Mm. <laughs> Obviously, heroin causes heroin addiction. We've been told this story for 100 years that's become totally part of our common sense. I thought it was, I mean, I thought I'd seen it unfold in front of me, right? So we think if we kidnapped the next 20 people to walk past your offices here in Florida, and we injected them every day with heroin three times a day for a month, say, like a villain in a Saw movie, at the end of that month, they'd all be heroin addicts for a simple reason. There's chemical hooks in heroin that their bodies would start to get used to and then their bodies would start to desperately physically crave them. And so at the end of it, they would have this tremendous physical hunger for the chemical hooks, right? That's why we call it being hooked, right? You want the chemical hook. It turns out that story's not wrong. Chemical hooks are real, but it's a really small part of what's happening with addiction. Um, When you look at the bigger picture, Um, And I only really began to understand this when I went to Vancouver and interviewed a man named Professor Bruce Alexander, who did an experiment that has transformed how we think about addiction. So he explained to me, the story we got in our heads, that addiction is caused primarily or totally by the chemical hooks, comes from a series of experiments that were done earlier in the 20th century. They're really simple experiments. Your viewers can try them at home if they're feeling a little bit sadistic. You take a rat, you put it in a cage, and you give it two water bottles. One is just water, and the other is water laced with either heroin or cocaine. If you do that, the rat will almost always prefer the drugged water and almost always kill itself within a couple of weeks, it'll overdose. So there you go, that's our story. The rat tries the drug, wants more and more of it, dies. But in the 70s, Professor Alexander came along and said, well, hang on a minute. You're putting the rat alone in an empty cage. It's got nothing that makes life meaningful for rats. All it's got is the drugs. What would happen if we did this differently? So he built a cage that he called Rat Park, which is basically heaven for rats, right? They've got loads of friends, they've got loads of cheese, they've got loads of colored balls, they can have loads of sex. Anything a rat likes in life is there mm-hmm. in Rat Park. And they've got the drug water, the normal water and the drug water. And of course they try both, they don't know what's in them. This is the fascinating thing. In Rat Park, they don't like the drug water very much. None of them use it compulsively, none of them overdose. So you go from almost 100% compulsive use and overdose when they don't have the things that make life worth living to no compulsive use and overdose when they have what you were talking about before, meaning, purpose, the things that make life worth living for them. And what I learned from this, there's loads of human examples we can talk about, but what I learned from this is that the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, valuable though that is to many people, the opposite of addiction is connection. And the reason I say this in response to this video game addiction uh, stuff you read out, Patrick, is I think it's too simplistic to say, oh, the video game, this boy that you described, I Mm -hmm. forget how old he was. 17. Yeah, the 17 year old boy, it's way too simplistic to say the video game did that to him, right? The video game did that to him in a context where all, I'm sure, obviously I don't know the story, but I'm sure all sorts of things were fucking him up. And every addictive behavior, whether it's video games, cocaine, porn, whatever it might be, is an attempt to not be present in your life because your life is too painful a place to be, right? You, you want to not be present, so you obsessively use the porn, you obsessively play video games, whatever it might be. That helps us to understand, by the way, why what we do here in the US 
is such a fucking disaster with the war on drugs. Because what we do is we get addicted people and we say, oh, we need to inflict more pain on them in order to give them an incentive to stop. But when you know that pain is the fucking fuel, pain is the driver, mm. you can see, sometimes we say oh, it doesn't work. Truth is much worse. It makes the addiction worse, right? Does that all, what do you, what do you make of that? Well, I'm curious I, about your thoughts. The, the, the first thing that popped in my mind, you said is, is, all right, they're in a cage. So the thing that comes to my mind is we've seen the stats on what's happened since COVID. Everyone's been locked in their cage, yeah. right? Other than maybe here in Florida and other, certain other states. So if you have the choice of just sipping on water or sipping on water with heroin, if you're the rat and you're in your cage, you're going to take the heroin. Using a human example, if you're sitting at home alone doing nothing, you know, you have to work, apparently. Maybe you're not. Maybe you're collecting unemployment. You're getting stimulus checks. Maybe you got to hop on a Zoom, do work, but you're locked in your proverbial cage. Okay, there's some liquor in the cabinet. There's some pot over there on the desk. Maybe there's some harder, uh, you know, pills, Drugs, opiates. Yeah. Dro they're sitting there. You're in your cage. So I I'm sensing this cage analogy is what, analogy that is what leads to people saying, well, based on the two options I have of sipping on water or doing some drugs, I'm in this cage anyway, let's party. Is that part of what this rat cage analogy is? Yeah, I've got a friend. Um, so as you know, we- Interesting, we, I wanna read this comment before sure, you please. go, which validates your point. Uh, crypto trends uh, 101, I used to be addicted to meth. I know, sad, but it's true. The environment and things worth living for are what made me better. Yeah, I think this really fits with what you're saying, Adam, which is that, so a lot of people watching will know, uh, in the last year we had the highest overdose deaths ever. And that's staggering because just before the pandemic, people thought, well, it can't go higher than it is yeah. now. Um, and so my friend, the writer, Andrew Sullivan said to me, it's like we did an experiment to see if you were right, right? I've been saying for 10 years, the opposite of addiction is connection. If you increase disconnection, you'll increase addiction. And here we are, right? We increase disconnection in what may be a justified cause, but it has caused a horrific increase in not just addiction. Mm -hmm. And this fits with a wider way of thinking, right? Which is that everyone listening and everyone watching knows that you have natural physical needs, right? Obviously you need food, you need water, you need shelter, you need clean air. If I took those things away from you, you'd be in real trouble real fast. But there's equally strong evidence that all human beings have natural psychological needs. Mm -hmm. You need to feel you belong. Human connection. You need to feel your life has meaning and purpose. You need to feel that people right. see you and value you. You need to feel you've got a future that makes sense. Of course. And if you, if you deprive people of their psychological needs, that will manifest in all sorts of problems. You'll have increased suicide, which we have. You'll have increased um, homicide, which we have. Right. You'll have increased uh, um, uh, addiction, which we have, and overdose deaths. And you can see this. This is why some of the best people who've studied this, professors, Anne Case and Angus Dayton called the opioid crisis deaths of despair. When a factory shuts down in a town, the, over the next five years, the death rate among people who work there more than doubles, right? Now that's not difficult to understand. Anyone who hears that knows immediately why, right? So it's not, of course the drug plays a role, just like the video game may in this mm -hmm. case, I don't know anything about this particular case, but the video game may play a role, but, but the drug and the video game enter in a context. And most people who use even quite hard drugs, and this really surprised me because it wasn't the experience of my family, but if you look at the evidence from people like Professor Carl Hart at Columbia University and others, most people who use even quite hard drugs, like even meth and, and heroin, do not become addicted and are not harmed by it. Now, of course, there's a minority who are harmed who need our love and support, but why can some people do it and not others? There's some biological contribution. Some people have a little bit more of a genetic um, uh, vulnerability, but most of it is about these bigger psychological and social factors. If your life's going well, you know, and you're happy and you wanna be present in your life, you can probably snort a line of coke, you'll be okay. If, you're, if the factory shut down and you're stuck in a place like Manadnock, New Hampshire, where I went, where people are in deep despair through no fault of their own, you know, well, it's gonna be a lot more dangerous for you because you're gonna to want to not be present in your life. So if you enjoyed this little short segment from the podcast that we did, here's another short segment to watch. Or if you wanna see the entire podcast, click over here. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.